Hello, this is Jitte Wagen and this is the second video in a series of videos in which I will be introducing QGIS 3.4 Long Term Stable Release. In this uh, second screencast I will be uh, addressing um, three main things. The first of all is georeferencing, the second is to either access external data through plugins uh, within QGIS or by directly going to external sources uh, on the internet and finally um, I will be uh, showing how to uh, digitize some data okay so in order to start the demonstration on georeferencing we will start with uh, where we uh, left off in uh, the first video uh, in um, in this project where we have the uh, LiDAR data, so the AHA N3, we have um, an archaeological uh, feature layer, we have here some topography, and we have a CSV file uh, plotted. Uh, finds. Now, um, what we are going to do is we are going to add another raster file uh, that contains more information on topography and we will uh, try and uh, use some reference points in our current data set to georeference properly the, uh, the raster file that we will be adding. Now we can find this raster file in our data set. And the raster file we are going to work with is called the uh, georeferier met verharding. So this means to georeference on the topography, and we will edit our uh, our table of contents. <coughs> now, georeferencing means that you um, uh, have an, uh, a raster that actually contains, well, usually contains no um, ne neither a coordinate reference system, but also no actual coordinates. And what happens if you uh, if you insert a an image file without any uh, information for QGIS, not even coordinates to interpret, uh, it will be placed in a QGIS project simply at the 0, 0.0 file in its upper left corner. Um, of course, it will ask first. Uh, something uh, which it always asks if it can find information on the uh, coordinate reference system and well obviously this one has nothing defined so we can already set it properly to the uh, Amersfoort RD new system and okay still of course nothing useful happens because the, the image itself has no coordinate information embedded so if we zoom to layer we can see Indeed, if we uh, go with the cursor to the upper left corner of the image, we can see here in the coordinates um, window that it's um, inserted at 0, 0.0 in the upper left corner. Now, in order to uh, properly georeference this, um, this raster file, we will use a, uh, a georeferencer plugin. And we can get to the plugins by going to the QGIS menu plugins and select manage and install plugins. Now we will come back to this um, this menu more often because this is uh, a very um, useful part of QGIS. Of course, QGIS is a, an open source program it has been built. Uh, by enthusiastic, by contrib contributions of enthusiastic um, volunteers coding um, plugins for uh, for QGS, and actually that's the way QGS also grows by incorporating more and more of these plugins in its core code set, in its core code base. But in any case, the uh, the plugin menu, and you can see uh, currently it contains. 469 different plugins is the place where you can go and search if you have some specific functionality that you, you can't find in QGIS 
uh, you can go and look for that here. So if we um, look for uh, georeferencing, so we uh, enter uh, georef as a term, we will um, arrive here at the subselection of plugins we have here the georeferencer gdo which is the one i always use and actually this is a core plugin so it's already installed you also are not able to install uh, uninstall it but we have to um, make it active by uh, hitting the, uh, the tick box over here so if we do that and then we close the menu we can access the uh, georeferencer directly through our uh, the raster uh, menu option now if we then click on the uh, georeferencer uh, menu option uh, a separate window opens in which we can start our georeferencer project now the georeferencer project starts by actually adding the raster that you want to georeference separately to this uh, georeferencer so we will do that here it is again of course because we are editing it to uh, adding it to a different component of QGS we will have to set the coordinate reference system that we want to use and now in this uh, georeferencer we have uh, a couple of functions that I will uh, go through one by one. Okay, so um, the most important concept of um, georeferencing is, of course, to uh, use ground control points in which you say, well, this specific location on my um, raster that I want to georeference has a corresponding point to the data that is already on its right location in my map canvas. So for example, a corner of a building, crossroads, an edge of a field, uh, and of course, needless to say, the more precise you can indicate the location, so the precision uh, of your uh, ground control point, and the, the more accurate that location is in your already um, georeference data so in your map canvas so that it would be accuracy and uh, the better your georeferencing operation will turn out to be so these tools over here um, are about adding points deleting points and moving points so we can start using them uh, in a short while to start uh, georeferencing um, here we have transformation settings which are actually quite important Of which the most significant one is the transformation type. If you click on the arrow, you see that there are several options. And so the transformation type refers to the degree of distortion that is allowed uh, when you, uh, let's say, force the, the raster you want to georeference uh, using your ground control points on the right location in, uh, in your map canvas. And you can imagine that, that these points um, may not be optimal. They may be maybe not very accurate if you couldn't find very good reference points. It may also be that you, the map you need to georeference is in a, a very different projection um, than, the, than the, the project, JS project in your map canvas uh, you are currently working in. It may be that there are errors on either maps so there, there are many reasons why these ground control points will not perfectly match or that there are some kind of random or systematic error some way um, introduced. Now, and then these transformation types here mainly refer to the degree to which you allow your, um, your to georeference raster to be distorted. Now, linear actually is a bit different in the sense that that just creates a world file uh, storing the uh, ground control points and the transformation information and actually doesn't transform your raster into a new file whereas the other um, options do now Helmert is uh, the most common one because this allows for 
scaling and rotation. So if you assume that your data is in, in the same coordinate reference systems and there are no errors and you have accurate points, then the Helmert will be very likely uh, the way to go. And beyond Helmert, you get different kinds of distortions, uh, polynomial algorithms that allow for, uh, for example, something like curvature. And then you have thin plate spline that actually allows for a whole different set of um, um, variability in, uh, in, in, let's say, disagreements between ground control points. It's, it's similar to the rubber sheeting concept that, that you may know, and it's actually a good analogy for what actually happens if you would um, pin a rubber sheet um, over uh, a surface and it will be torn in different directions to fit as well as possible with the um, with the location of the pins. And then you have projective, uh, which is used when there's a um, probably a projective um, difference um, between the two uh, between the, the the image that you need to georeference and the uh, the map canvas. Okay, so we will set this to Helmert, which is um, the one I want to use. Then the second uh, transformation parameter here is the resampling method. Now you can imagine that if you do a transformation that you will indeed rotate um, your uh, raster file. Uh, and if you do that, you can imagine that uh, the original cell um, information is not fitting with the new uh, cell information because the raster will always stay uh, a, a rectangular uh, shaped file type so it will always be a, a grid of, um, of raster cells so if there's a rotation it will not exactly fit the orientation uh, of the cells your, your original information so there, there is some kind of resampling involved and here you can set the, um, the strategy for the resampling and the most important thing to remember here is that you can choose between, uh, well, a nearest neighbor on one hand and, and options like cubic and cubic spline on the other hand. And the important thing to understand here is that a nearest neighbor is best for discrete data. So for data like this um, topographical map, Whereas if you have a continuous data, you will probably want to use a cubic or cubic spline. We'll leave it at nearest neighbor and we'll have to set a, a target coordinate reference system. Okay, then of course there's an uh, output setting here for the name of the output raster and some uh, less um, important um, stuff like compression, etc. The, the final option here, load in QGIS when done. Um, seems to me a very handy one. So I'll accept these settings and go on with the actual georeferencing process. Okay, so um, I will be using uh, the add point function to, uh, to generate the first ground control point. Um, and I know that the, uh, the edge of this feature here, the, the corner actually uh, can be found in the shape file with the uh, for harding so a topographical shape file so i'll click here and then um, i get uh, presented the option of either enter absolute coordinates here so if i would know these coordinates or they would somehow be on the map or if you would have a, an archaeological field drawing with coordinates you could use those of course but i don't have these so i will just go uh, to the option from map canvas and I will look for the corresponding um, element in my uh, data here and that is actually um, the corner of this feature here you can already see I thought it was uh, in the topo topography file that's actually in the uh, elevation data raster so I can use this for now but this is not going to be very precise so I will, I will uh, place the control point but i'm probably going to uh, to change this afterwards if i want to have a very precise um georeferencing um, process 
Now you can see that uh, I added this point and now in my ground control point table, a point actually appeared. Uh, it's visible, it has an ID. You have source X and Y, which refer to the location on this, uh, this image. And then I have a destination X and Y that actually are coordinates in the, uh, in the Dutch grid. So in order to be able to do a helmet projection, I need at least three points. So I will look for other two points um, to actually um, go on and, and uh, perform this, uh, this transformation. Okay, so I know that uh, my um, topography uh, shape file actually shows the um, the roads. So I think I will be able to find um, corners, uh, sharp corners in the uh, road system, such as this one. But you can still see that also the um, the roster that I'm now uh, here trying to georeference is not very. Uh, has not does not have a very high resolution. I'm not able to pinpoint exact locations to the centimeter um, accurate. So we're we're going to have to make do with uh, with quite a broad range of error here. But nonetheless, I can kind of visually establish that I have a a corner over here. I will select this one, and I know where I can find it in the topography because that should roughly correspond to this corner. So I will use that as a point and then finally I have a kind of a similar situation over here where I use this point and go to the map and I know that should roughly correspond to this point. And then I'll accept. Okay, so what now happens is interesting because you see that I now have three points in my uh, GCP table. Um, and uh, something happened over here in the field residual pixels that originally was empty and now contains um, values, data. Um, and these are residual error. So what they actually express is similar to what you see here, which means that um, if this helmet transformation is going to be carried out based on these three control points that I added, then uh, QGIS can already establish that there is a tension in the placement of these points. So the, the exact um, distance and angle between these points here on the original um, raster, if we place them at the exact locations I pinpointed in the map canvas, um, the distances and angles will not be completely respected. There, there will be a bit deviation between the projected points on the map canvas um, in relation to, uh, to the, the, the points as they are defined on this uh, raster. Now, this is not necessarily a problem and in fact, given the uh, the lack of, uh, of, of uh, ability to pinpoint very precise locations and um, this is an error that we will have to uh, to deal with that we will have to accept for now but it is an interesting um, piece of information that is being presented here because um, now you see that they, this is expressed in pixels so it's not even that bad i mean there's a, a one pixel on this Raster is going is probably quite a distance, uh, at least uh, a meter, I think. Um, so you don't want to uh, place too much faith on the projected uh, 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 raster that that we are now going to add to the GIS. Um, but the the interesting stuff is is that if you have here an, a value that is very extreme in relation to the others um then that's something to pay attention to too so so let's say that um, one of these values would be times 10 or times 100 so instead of uh, 1.3 and 1.1 and 1.4 i would have here 13.1 um that would be something I would want to investigate a bit further because then it is very likely that I made an error that I, I placed a, a ground control point 
on a different uh, and actually not corresponding location in the map canvas. Um, or I made I made some kind of um, maybe I replaced two similar looking items, etc. I interchanged them. In any case, um, that is something that you could go and uh, search for. So in that sense, uh, if you would have such a problem, you could select the ground control point. You could delete it. You can also move a point, and you can do all these operations to see if your residual in the end would get uh, less. So since we already established that this was this this one was indeed very difficult to pinpoint, and that maybe I could better look for an edge like that, just as a matter of demonstration, I will remove this point and place it to a location which I think is better suited, and see if it is any good to the residuals. So in order to delete this point, I can select the, uh, the delete point function and click on the point. It then disappears and then I can simply add a new point. And I will go now for the, the edge here actually, which is the edge between the building and the parker, parking space. And I will select it again from the map canvas that should correspond to this angle. Um, and I will select that one. I will click OK, and you see that immediately um, my residual errors um, have been reduced by a, a, at least a third, so by a considerable amount, um, which means uh, that my uh, transformation, my, my reprojection of this data is going to be much better uh, overall because there go there's going to be less tension, and most of the tension was actually due to this specific point. Um, so yeah, this is this is how you go about it. You can, you can of course use um, many more points, but in this case, I just want to prove um, demonstrate the principle. So I will now go on and actually uh, execute the, uh, the the transformation of this image. Now you can do this by hitting the, uh, the start georeferencing button. I will do it. Um, something happened. Georeference successful. Um, and I can now actually look at my map canvas and I can see that indeed this must be more or less successful. You see that the, uh, the features on my map uh, quite well correspond to the features in the uh, shapefile for Harding. Um, all the roads more or less um, overlap uh, well enough um, so I, I am able to, uh, with a margin of error, as I said before, use the information now on my topographical map, maybe just as a background layer, but maybe also to see where um, houses have been built um, after this uh, archaeological excavation uh, has taken place, um, etc. Okay, so now I have this uh, transformation uh, successful. In my map and you can see also that in my table of contents uh, now the te georefereren met verharding underscore modified has been added so this is the a new raster file that has been generated and added to my uh, my layers bit so now i can close this um the georeferencer window um a, a final option that may be interesting to uh, to point out is that it's possible to, um, to save the ground control points. Um, and this can be interesting. I mean, to uh, if you look at it in terms of information about your, your data file, the ground control points are actually meta info uh, saying something about an edit to your data. So you got an original file or you scanned the file, or you received it from someone uh, you processed it, and during that process, you made some decisions that influenced the quality and the end result and the usability of the end result. And that is partly defined by the ground control points that you use for the transformation. So it can be useful to save these ground control points as uh, metadata, so you can always uh, bring up this information to someone who is interested in, in the process that you used, it can also be interesting if for some reason 
you are not happy with the results, you want to save it and come back to the data, the ground control uh, points later, you want to load them and try if you can get it better, etc. etc. So it's very useful that you can uh, you have this functionality to save and load these ground control points. In this case, I'm not interested, so I'll just close the georeferencer. Okay, and now as a final step before going to the next um, thing I want to demonstrate, uh, getting data through plugins or via online um, data portals, uh, I want to clean up a little bit my, uh, my layers panel. Um, I made this selection of, uh, of features in uh, the spore art file. I still have the original uh, shape file in my, um, in my project. I will remove that layer because I don't need it anymore. And actually I also have now the original um, raster that uh, I wanted to georeference and the uh, actual georeferenced raster itself and as we remember this is still on its place at the 0, 0.0 coordinate um, well I don't need this obviously so I will also remove this from the uh, from the project and then uh, go back using the zoom to layer function to the uh, file and just um, as a just to point out the obvious um, the file that we now see appearing here in the uh, in the table of contents in our layers panel is of course also saved here in the uh, in the folder on our hard disk where we uh, store all the GIS data related to this project. So what I now want to demonstrate for the um, the second uh, element of the screencast is to how to access um, data uh, through plugins in QGIS or as I said through online geodata portals and first of all I will do this via plugins and I will do this um, first uh, using a plugin for Dutch governmental data and second uh, to do this with a plugin that actually uh, reaches for data all over the, the world. Now the plugin that I want to demonstrate for um, the, the Dutch Territory is the PayDoc plugin, which is Publieke Dienstverlening op de kaart, uh, roughly translated to public services on uh, on map. Um, and I will uh, th this this uh, plugin has been created um, because a lot of um, government bodies are actually um, uh, meeting the requirements of open data by offering the uh, the information that they collect and share uh, with the general uh, Dutch public uh, through this service. Um, and that is very useful, of course, for GIS uh, projects in the Netherlands. So in order to, uh, to get working with this plugin, we go again to the menu and the plugins option, manage and install plugins. And then we search for PDOK. Um, and then uh, we want um, the PDOC services plugin, install plugin, will download. And there it is. So that's very easy to, uh, to install. Um, now this plugin does two things. First of all, it's a location server. So what it in fact can do is it can um, access a search uh, function to, to find locations in the Netherlands. And second, um, we can use it to uh, to add um, all these uh, data files um, offered to all these different government bodies directly to our map. Now, I will first give you the demonstration of the letter function. If you click on the first icon, you can see here PayDoc services. You can see here exactly all uh, possible data files that you can uh, directly add to your map. Now, just as a demonstration of what uh, what's possible with this is I want to add a 25 centimeter uh, aerial photograph that has been auto rectified and I want to, uh, in, into, in, it's an uh, aerial photograph from 2018. And I want this in my map so I can just now click on lo load this layer in QGIS. 
I will close this and as you can see I will I now suddenly have and um, let's turn off the georeferenced file and I now have an aerial photograph and the further I zoom out the better you can see that this is indeed uh, the totality of the Dutch um, area so the Netherlands so that is of course very useful for all kinds of applications now there are many more kinds of information that you can uh, directly add to your uh, GIS so you can uh, open topography uh, add to your uh, your map you can add soil maps geomorphological maps uh, cadastral maps um, protected nature reserves and so on and so forth so there's a and a huge amount of um, of information to be found here now and then to demonstrate how this works as a location server so if I now would type in a location in the Netherlands and hit enter you can see that I will indeed be directly transported to the right location and as an additional thing you can also do this for a uh, postal code for example this is the postal code of the University of Amsterdam in the center of Amsterdam and then you'll be brought exactly to uh, to the center of this um, postal code location okay so anyway let's get back to our excavation uh, and as I promised I will also show a plugin that we can use to access uh, data on an international scale um, and the one um, that is very useful for that exercise is the quick map services plugin so if we again go to the plugins um, menu uh, and we'll uh, enter quick map we will uh, immediately see the quick map services and again hit install plugin it will download the plugin install and in this case a, a complete search panel will open and the way we can use this panel is by for example uh, go and search for a, uh, a a source of geodata that we know to be there so we can for example uh, search for google and then we get all the, uh, the data that google provides freely so we can for example open google satellite satellite hybrid google terrain google terrain hybrid and so on and so forth and if we click on that we say google satellite uh, hybrid add you can see that now indeed in my table of contents another layer appeared and if i drag this um to the uh, above the other layers you can see that i now indeed have a google information layer in my gis um, yeah and this of course we can do this with Bing Maps Google Maps and well a whole range of data providers that provide useful data on your uh, your research area um, another way of accessing quick map services is by going to the menu go for web and then select quick map services and here you can then go also to a few very commonly used sources of information like NASA data, map server, land set, uh, open street map and so on and so forth. So also all this information you can directly add to your map if you want. If we drag this one now we have open street map top topography in our map. Okay so now I want to show in addition to all these online resources and I don't really need these actually so I will throw them out again these were just here for demonstration and i'm happy with what we already have um, i will also close this panel we can always open the panel by view panels and then go for the search qms panel as you may well understand already um, in addition to accessing data directly in this way through QGIS there's also uh, a lot of data portals that actually provide data if you go to their website and um, 
actively search for uh, the right file, download it, store it on your file, and then access that data. And just as a, for demonstration purposes, I will do this with the um, Dutch uh, elevation uh, map, so the AHN again, of which we here have only a very small um, cut from the, from the total file because these map sheets are much larger and actually i want to have the whole sheet so let's now go to the uh, the website and get that data okay so now to get this data i uh, use my browser and add a search uh, terms here hn download and if everything is all right i will be transported immediately to the paydoc website now obviously many countries have their own central uh, uh, government portal through which they can uh, access uh, data concerning uh, a sp that specific country um, and here this is paydoc.nl but in, in another country um, you have to uh, go and look for that in this case, I will just access AHN3 downloads. Um, and yes, here we are. Um, so the AHN is being centrally collected in the Netherlands. Um, and we have had the AHN1 and the AHN2. And the current version that we can work with is AHN3. And the main differences between the, these versions is the resolution of the measurements. So the uh, resolution of the H and three measurements are uh, 1.3 uh, 20 centimeters. Now let's go and take a look where I can download this data. Okay, so <clears throat> if I go in the uh, pay, on the Paydoc website to the the tab data sets and I click on that. I can see here indeed the data sets they, that they are sharing that you can uh, download or and use. Now I, I'm interested in the AHN3 data, so we'll, uh, I will look for further details. Um, here you see the total coverage of the AHN3, um, some meta information, and then two options to actually get to the data. And, um, here this is divided between geo services and downloads um, and here the actual difference is that downloads will get you the actual file on your hard disk you will download all the data and you can work with that data whereas the geo services means that you get a URL link to a server through which you can get this data and also directly load it in your map um, which is possibly easier to, to do, um, but on the other hand, if you have all the data yourself on your hard disk, you can always work with it and do a lot of uh, many extra things when it comes to uh, manipulating the data. But I will show both ways to uh, to work with it. And to start with, uh, with the first one, I will use a geo surface. Now you can see that you have here quite a range of options. These are different protocols for web mapping and web mapping, uh, serving maps from a server into uh, uh, onto a client uh, system. I will not go into the details. That's a bit beyond the scope of the screencast. Um, I will just use the uh, first one, which is uh, WMS, web mapping services. Um, and in addition, down here, you can also see that you can uh, ask for specific products, which are then organized by their spatial horizontal resolution, so five meter cells or 50 centimeter cells, and then differentiated between digital surface models and digital terrain models, in which digital terrain models are the uh, elevation measurements with all the trees and cars and buildings, etc., filtered out of it. So you are left with the actual terrain and not with the total uh, uh, measured surface. Well, to uh, go to the, the web mapping servers, I will click on it. I will be uh, transported here, so HN3, WMS. Uh, and here I'll 
this is the most important thing I get this uh, this URL so if I then say uh, copy source location um, I can go to QGIS and then uh, as part of the browser over here in which you can access all your uh, GIS data sources you can scroll down to um, the WMS uh, symbol over here you can then right click set, set it to new connection I can uh, then insert AHN3 through WMS and enter the URL um, I leave it to no authentication because it's freely available and just hit OK and now you can see that I'm suddenly here treated with the possibility of um, selecting specific uh, file types and I, I already explained them so different resolutions and uh, different um, uh, filtered and unfiltered products but if I would want to have the most detailed one I would um, get this one and just select it and then drag it into our table of contents the layers panel and um, I can now uh, show that indeed I have a uh, a much more complete uh, model of the Netherlands. Actually, I have the total of the Netherlands now in uh, SAHN file. Yeah, that is going to take a long time to load, so I will just uh, forego on that. Um, but you can see here that the uh, HN data um, relative to our project is being real time and dynamically loaded. Now the other option I wanted to show was to uh, to download the data directly. So I will remove this one uh, and go back to the site. And now I will here hit back, go to the download section, HN3 download, and then I will uh, be transported here to this location, on which I can actually um, access a little map I think I have to reload this page here yeah. a little map that I can use to select the correct sheet because the original data files are relatively large files so the amount to I believe one gigabyte per file or something like that and um, so if you would have to download the whole set at once that would be very inefficient um, so I just want to uh, to download the data that is uh, relevant for uh, for the project I'm currently working on. So I'll just zoom in to the uh, location I need to be and directly download uh, the, uh, the correct data sheet. So here's Nijmegen and I need to download this data sheet actually because it's just north, it's just this area on, uh, on this little map. Um, I can then click on it and then the uh, files to download below here down here are uh, changed accordingly so again I want to go for the uh, 0.5 uh, meters uh, digital terrain model and I'll just download it so and you can see here uh, that this is 296 MB so this is uh, much less than the one gigabyte I was talking about but this is indeed only one of the products that is actually related to this uh, this data sheet so luckily it doesn't take very long and I will download this to my hard disk um, I will unzip it place it in my uh, GS data folder and then add it to uh, to our QGIS project There it goes. Here is our um, file in .tiff. I will go to uh, the correct location and paste it. And then we see that in a matter of seconds we can also access it through the uh, QGS browser. Let's take a look. Let's refresh. 
and here we can see that indeed the uh, the uh, edge and file has become available and again we can edit to our table of contents and then we see the grayscale um, visualization of our data and in this visualization it's very clear that we have here the digital terrain model because all the buildings have been uh, indeed filtered out and they are um, now white areas open areas in our uh, raster file probably having no data values if i select the uh, file and click on it indeed i have in band one no data on the uh, location where uh, the building has been filtered out okay so this is about getting data from external sources either using uh, plugins within QGIS or go to the uh, geodata portals online get the data through web mapping services or download the data and add it manually okay so now I would like to uh, go on to the last uh, part of the screencast which is about digitization so what I want to do is I want to uh, generate a new shape new shape file uh, I want to enter the uh, editing mode and actually start digitizing polygons in this new shape file okay so in order to find something useful to digitize I will go to the uh, raster file that we uh, georeferenced um, and what I uh, for the demonstration purpose say will be interested in is the uh, feature uh, that we see here in the uh, elevation model that may be connected with these ancient uh, water filled ditches and I want to see to what degree um, those ditches actually overlap with these uh, these topographical features so for example these these roads that we have here and maybe some of these houses so in order to do that uh, i need to uh, create first of all a new shape file okay so in order to create a new shape file uh, we'll go to the uh, this menu on the left here and for creating a new shape file so instead of adding um, a vector layer or ross layer or whatever we can go to uh, the uh, the asterisk sign here and create a new shape file layer now if we click on that button we get into this uh, new shape file layer window in which we have to uh, set a file name so uh, i'm just going to call this topo graphy um, save uh, the file encoding is is fine the way it is um, we want to uh, to digitize polygon so i'll choose for that one uh, we can already set its coordinate reference system which is perfectly fine and if we are interested we can already create fields through this menu so if we want specific fields in our attribute table we are able to uh, to define them already in this phase um, and it will if we create a field it will be added to the fields list now of course we already have an id field which is always there every feature uh, that you will digitize will get its own unique id um, for database management uh, management purposes but let's say that we want uh, another field uh, to say type so we can enter a uh, class of topographical feature um, text data is fine for that we could of course also in case of other field types uh, choose other um, or other field uh, purposes uh, choose another data type and then we have a length precision it's all fine and we add it to the fields list so now we have two fields uh, of which we defined one ourselves if I click OK the shape file will be created and immediately added to our project and if we then inspect the attribute table we can indeed see that i have two columns here id that was by default there and type that we generated ourselves okay so clearly there are no uh, attributes uh, no features yet in this file because we just created it um, and in order to start digitizing we have to set this uh, shape file to editing mode and this is similar to the principle I showed in the first video on the attribute table 
you need to set it to editing before you can actually change. So add or delete or modify elements in this file in order to avoid uh, corruption and conflicts uh, with other people that may be doing uh, something similar. So once I hit the editing button, um, the file will be locked for anybody else uh, to work with. So indeed, this is the digiti digitization or the editing toolbar. Um, I click on the toggle editing and then you see that um, the icon here in the changes uh, with the symbol that indicates that this is now a file in editing mode or a layer in editing mode. Okay, so uh, I find it uh, handy to uh, add a toolbar for uh, digitizing. And it's just a little bit more uh, more handy than uh, than the one that uh, that we have here. This is the the digitizing toolbar, but I also want the advanced digitizing toolbar. Um, as you see me now, just just now doing, you can just right click on any of these empty spaces of the interface to also do the same thing you could do with view, and then select for panels or toolbars and, and switch them on or off. Now I would like to have this uh, this advanced editing toolbar and I can start using the features here um, to, uh, to, to start digitizing the topography. Okay, so now the actual uh, digitization um, process is uh, quite a straightforward one. So let's say I wanna start by drawing some of these houses over here to see to what degree they uh, open possibly overlap with archaeology. Now, clearly these are not very um, precise to begin with, um, but let's say that, uh, that I will try and digitize them as accurately as possible. Um, I will uh, now select here the Add Polygon feature, click on that, then my uh, mouse location changes into a cursor, and I can start clicking with the left mouse button to um, as accurately as possible start drawing to what I believe here to be the boundaries of the house. Now, and if I uh, complete to what I think is a good representation of this house, uh, I can uh, hit the right mouse button to finish the drawing of the polygon. Now, if I do that, I can finish it by giving in a, an ID and by giving in indeed a type, and I will say that this is a house, I hit OK, and now I have a polygon added to my uh, my shape file. Um, just to show, I can now select it, of course, and I can hit it with the ID tool, and then I see here in my identify result screen that I have indeed a feature with ID 1 of a type house, and if I open the attribute table, I will see the same information, a record has been created. Now, if I then go on, I will get more records, etc., etc. Okay, so to show now a couple of other things that you can do with the digitization and advanced digitization toolbar. So let's say I select this feature and I would want to move it. I can use here the move feature tool. I select it, click on the uh, feature I wanna move and I can just uh, place it on a different location within the map canvas. Equally useful is, for example, the vertex tool uh, that I can use to uh, manipulate the individual vertices, so to remodel the polygon, actually. Um, so, for example, if I click on, uh, on one of the vertices, I can replace the vertex and, uh, and make sure that the, uh, the polygon uh, is changed accordingly. If I hover over the edge of a polygon, you can see that the plus sign appears, and that means that I can add another vertex here as to make the shape more complex. Um, and similarly, of course, I can also select a vertex and hit the delete button uh, as to uh, get rid of, uh, of a specific vertex. So in this uh, way, it is very easy to, uh, to create um, to, uh, to modify the uh, and, and replace the polygons that you have created. So now I actually want to have my, uh, my, my polygon back in place uh, and in order to undo 
these kind of changes you can just hit Ctrl Z and it will be uh, indeed uh, all your actions will be uh, rewinded and you will uh, end up with where you started in the first place okay so um, to show another uh, advanced uh, digitization functionality it may be interesting to uh, to go to uh, this area over here where we have these uh, these two parallel streets that actually appear to be uh, overlapping with the uh, excavation and the, the possible um, uh, interesting features that were identified in the excavation and to start with I will just uh, draw the polygon as a whole um, and then I want to show how you can cut out the center part of a polygon so I will start with just digitizing a new polygon um, I'm just going to roughly follow along the edge of the streets that are here located and I will end the, uh, the polygon hit give an idea and say that this is a street hit OK okay so now in order to uh, literally uh, cut a hole in this uh, polygon so to make it into a ring um, I need to set it to transparent but because of course I want to base my uh, edit on the underlying uh, topographical uh, feature uh, which I'm now not seeing because it's overlaid by my polygon so I can go to the topography get the properties of my topography shapefile get to the symbology tab and here you have this function called opacity and here I can set the uh, the transparency of our layer. So if I set this to 50%, I can now see through my shape file, and that makes it more easy to cut a hole in it. Now, um, for this, I need this tool, add ring, um, zoom in a little bit, and follow then directly the area in between these two parallel streets. Again quite badly visible but more or less this is the uh, the area that I want to cut out now I have it uh, defined and um, now I can hit the right mouse button again and as you can see now um, very neatly um, my polygon is turned into a ring and I have this uh, this island in between Okay, so now uh, is a final demonstration of the tools that, that there are here. I won't go through all of them. Is um, the uh, the cutting tool, so uh, the split features or split parts tools, um, which can be interesting for digitization purposes. So let's say I was to uh, digitize um, these houses, but I, in fact, I just want to digitize the whole block at once. So I will um, do it like this and have a whole block in one polygon defined. Enter, get another feature. I will call this uh, block. Enter, and now I have the whole block. Um, what I can do, for example, now is to use this, uh, this scissor tool to split these uh, features uh, in two. So um, again, making use of the transparency, I will say that I have here um, a split between two houses, um, as well as here, as well as here, and then finally on this location. And if I then hit enter, uh, the right mouse click, I can now individually uh, select these polygons so you can see that now these polygons are indeed uh, have become individual polygons okay and then finally very important uh, functionality when it comes to digitization so let's say that uh, I don't want to digitize all my uh, elements uh, like this and in fact I will just um, select the whole bunch and uh, hit here the delete button in the uh, in the toolbar but I want to uh, draw everything manually 
and I want to make sure that the edges between two polygons exactly correspond, actually the same way they did when I split those features in, in several parts, but um, now I want to do this manually. And there's a tool for this, uh, which is the snapping tool. So snapping functionality in, um, in, compu in computer-aided drawing programs such as GIS actually means that your cursor always kind of magnetically um, connects to the nearest um, vertex or edge of a polygon or a polyline or a point given certain uh, constraints, so given certain uh, limits when it comes to distances. And I will show you how to do that in QGIS. So for QGIS, uh, you can just uh, activate a toolbar, which is the snapping toolbar. This is over here. You can then enable it. Um, there are a couple of uh, interesting uh, functions here. So you can set snapping to all layers or you can just uh, snap to the active layer, which can be interesting if you use vector data from several layers to define new features on. Uh, but in this case, I will just leave it onto active layers. And what it here is probably the most important setting that there is because this uh, is the exactly the um, distance limit I was uh, talking about because of course you don't want to uh, snap to a nearest point whenever you place a uh, you click on any location in the map you you only want it to happen if you're actually close to a point you want to snap to now you can define this distance in in pixels which is related to the pixels on your screen or you can define it in meters. And what's actually handy is, uh, is, is up to you and your digitization uh, scheme. Given the, uh, the setup here, I think that three meters is going to be quite a, quite a good estimation of a useful uh, snapping ses setting. So if I would now create a new feature, you can see that if I uh, hover my, um, uh, my cursor within three meters of a vertex, it actually directly um, snaps to that location. So now wherever I click on my left mouse button, the actual point will be placed on that location. The same here. Um, and now I can uh, simply finish the polygon, um, enter um, the right mouse button to finish it and uh, finish the, uh, the feature. And now these two vertices are literally on the same coordinate. So there's no space, there's no very small distance in between them. They are exactly the same. And this is of course a fundamentally important feature when you digitize uh, polygons or, or vector data in general. Now another button uh, when it comes to snapping session is, um, uh, settings, which can be interesting is this. So you can um, here, also make sure that you uh, not only um, snap to vertices, but also to segments. And that can be handy if you need to follow a, uh, a specific uh, polygon in which uh, the segments are actually important to be able to, uh, to snap to. Okay, so um, with this demonstration of editing and, and doing various modifications and um, the snapping uh, functionality, we have come to the end of this screencast in which I've been dealing with uh, the topics of georeferencing, the topic of um, getting data, external data through plugins within QGIS and uh, getting uh, data from outside sources um, uh, such as online geo portals. Uh, and finally, I have, uh, I have showed uh, how to digitize in QGIS. Um, so I will now uh, finish this by uh, saving our edits, turn off the editing session. So now uh, the data that we have here um, will stay and is only uh, changeable if we would re-enter the editing um, session. But with this, we've come to the end. Um, so uh, I want to thank you for um, listening and watching this screencast and uh, see you in the next.